So it's my great pleasure to uh, welcome Heather home this morning to our webinar series. And I, I wanted to put this infographic up. So the image on the far left is the infographic that um, Heather and partners it was from Xerxes. Heather, do I remember that right? Uh, created this great infographic. I broke it up just so you could see it a little better on your screen, but you kind of lose the flow, um, the seasonal flow. And this is something that um, in the pollination world, we get asked all the time, how do I manage my perennials so that I have habitat, um, but also can kind of clean up the stems and not um, get in the way of overwintering. So I'm gonna, um, Heather's not really gonna talk about this today because she's focusing more on wasps than on managing our landscapes, but I'm gonna post this um, to our website so that you can access this infographic because if you get asked the question as many times as I do, you'll um, love having access to this PDF to send on. So Heather Holm is um, an author, a biologist, an amazing photographer, um, and um, so I'm really excited to welcome her this morning. Um, she's very active on iNaturalist, and if you're not on iNaturalist, um, it's, it's really a wonderful free app. It's a community science tool. It's a learning tool, and um, it's a way that you can help to add to what scientists know about the living world. Anything living or formerly living, you can post on iNaturalist. And so I just happened to pull up um, Heather's profile and some of the bees and others, other critters that she's been observing. Um, she's in Minnesota. And so the, uh, the critter, the bee actually, that she sees the most or has observed the most and posted to iNaturalist is the rusty patch bumblebee, which we haven't seen in Ohio for um, uh, almost two decades. So um, it's really wonderful to, to be able to follow Heather. Um, you can follow people on iNaturalist and you'll get word when they post new observations. And as I said, her photography is just amazing. And you know that from her books as well. Um, Heather, you must have a new um, project going with spiders because I noticed yesterday you <laughs> uploaded um, lots of spider images. It's, and... um, it's the only insect or arachnid that I've found so far this year, Denise. So it's just been... the excitement of photographing a live a live living thing. Yeah. You, you found a lot of different species too. So that was, that was cool. Yeah. So Heather today is going to talk about her new book, Wasp, Their Biology, Diversity, and Role as Beneficial Insects and Pollinators of Native Plants. So Heather, again, welcome. So glad to have you here and I'll turn the floor over to you. Thank you, Denise. All right. Let's get some settings here. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Denise. It's, it's a pleasure to be part of this speaker series and I hope spring is coming quickly to where you live. Uh, we have a dreary rainy day today and as I, Denise um, showed you that I'm just anxiously awaiting the emergence of some of the pollinating insects, bees and wasps, but so far uh, yesterday I photographed some spiders and uh, found a couple of lace wings uh, on the wing in my yard. So. I hope you guys are starting to see bees and maybe some wasps, um, but I'll be not too far behind where you are. So I'm going to be focusing on uh, predatory wasps today, which my new book Wasp largely covers. And, and sort of I want to walk you through the, the classification of wasps because it's a little bit confusing. So just to help you understand some of the major groups and how that how the groups break down and uh, what some of the basically the flower visiting wasps and that's really what my new book focuses on because many people already are what I call pollinator watchers they are out in their gardens they're purposefully planting flowering plants to attract pollinating insects and uh, many of the flowering plants that we put in our gardens and landscapes attract wasps as well. So I'll be talking about what is the role of flowering plants in the wasp life cycle? Um, how are wasps related to bees? Because I'll be telling you that bees are wasps, in fact, but they're just a little bit hairier and have uh, a different diet. So hopefully uh, if you're already uh, sort of a bee enthusiast, you'll start to understand uh, how closely related these two groups of insects are, and um, why wasps are just as cool and fascinating as bees. So just to start with, um, wasp, bees, horntails, sawflies, all belong to the order Hymenoptera, 
and um, there's one one significant break or breakdown in the suborders, two suborders, uh, Symphyta and Apocrita. And the suborder Symphyta includes sawflies and horntails, and then the other suborder uh, includes ants, bees, uh, and wasps. And um, these numbers that I have on the slide uh, are numbers of species in North America, north of Mexico. The numbers are quite old, so we know we know a lot more about uh, bee species diversity and how many species we have in North America. That's not the case for a lot of the other groups in within the order Hymenoptera. So these are just approximate numbers to give you a sense of the, the breakdown. So don't email me after and say, your numbers are way off <laughs> because uh, many, many of the groups of insects in this order really need a lot of revision and updates. But let's start with uh, the first suborder, Symphyta which includes the sawflies and horntails. And you basically can think of these wasps as the wasteless wasps. And the two examples of the adults I have pictured here on the slide, the horntail and the sawfly, uh, they don't ha have the, the typical constricted waste that you would expect to see in a wasp. And they, um, their larvae are plant feeding. The horntail larvae typically feed on wood. And with the, um, aid of fungi to help break down the wood fiber is what the, their larvae are consuming. Um, sawfly larvae, on the other hand, are more caterpillar-like. They often feed gregariously in groupings like I had pictured on the bottom right image. They look like caterpillars, uh, although they have a number of prolegs, and uh, the, you'll find them on certain plants. They have a number of specific host plants. And sawflies uh, are very diverse um, and you'll find them flying on the wing, the adults, throughout most of the growing season. In fact, you may find some uh, on the first blooming willows in the next couple of weeks, depending on where you live. And there, the, this group of, particularly the horntails are probably some of the most primitive types of wasps that we have. So if we look at the other suborder, uh, it's basically broken down into two groups. The aculeata is a subclade. The parasitic wasp or the parasitica don't really have a group or clade that they belong to, but they are a significant branch in this suborder. And there's really uh, a, a big anatomical difference between the parasitic wasps and the wasps that belong to the aculeata or also called the stinging wasps. And you can see there's the parasitic wasps are very diverse, almost 10,000 species. And these wasps uh, are parasitic, so they don't build their own nest. And this is an example of one, a very large conspicuous species, the giant ichneumon wasp, uh, the female in the bottom image is drilling her ovipositor through wood and she's actually laying her egg inside of a horntail larva that's feeding on the wood fiber inside of a dead tree. So their, their ovipositor is a combined egg laying and uh, venom injection apparatus. And there, that's a more primitive or maybe less evolved apparatus of wasps, but um, that's typical of all the parasitica. Now, if we go back and look at the um, aculeata, What's the big anatomical difference is, is their ovipositor is now just used for, as for venom injection or stinging. And like bees, they lay their egg through an opening at the base of their abdomen. So that's sort of the big an anatomical difference. But of course, there's very different, what, we, what I'd call lifestyle differences between the two, largely that the parasitic don't build their own nest and the aculeata wasps are mostly nest building. So within the aculeata are two uh, very recognizable groups, it also includes ants as well as bees. And you can see that bees are part of or um, offspring or derivative of the stinging wasp. So they are closely related to the stinging wasp. Um, the big difference between the stinging wasp and bees, of course, is they have different diets. And, but um, here we go. <laughs> they, uh, they, bees of course are vegetarian. So um, instead of collecting and preying on insects and spiders like their wasp ancestors, they likely with the radiation of angiosperms or flowering plants, 
they found some very nutritious food sources in the form of pollen and nectar. So bees uh, also have developed uh, very hairy bodies, which enables the females to collect and carry pollen back to the nest to feed their offspring. So really that's the big uh, difference between uh, bees and the predatory wasps that I'll be talking about today. Now the predatory wasps, as I said, they, they hunt other insects and spiders and that's what they're provisioning or caching inside of the nests that they prepare. But the adults, many of the adults are most of their calories or food source does come from flower nectar. Uh, other sugary sub substances as well, uh, tree sap and honeydew you may see wasps feeding on. But flower nectar is very important. So if we think of this from uh, a, a landscape context, uh, an abundance of flowering plants is very important for bees, but it's also very important for these predatory wasps in order for them to fill out their day's uh, list of activities. So uh, we have the predatory wasps like bees that nest above ground. And this is an, it's sort of an example of some of the similarities. Uh, the, the top image is of an orchard mason bee nest and it's uh, one of the few bees that use, uses mud to make the partitions and to divide up the individual brood cells inside of the nest. And many of our above ground nesting solitary wasps including our mason wasps also use mud. So you can see the larva pictured here in the individual brood cell. Um, the difference of course is the bee larva is feeding on a combination of pollen and nectar that the mother has provisioned inside of the nest cell. And the wasp in the bottom image is feeding on a big pile of caterpillars that the uh, female wasp has captured and stuffed inside of the brood cell. And then of course the mud, the similarities in the mud partition. And you'll even notice that that mud partition has a, a bit of a curve. So the, it helps orient the uh, larva when it develops into an adult um, into which, which way is the exit from the nest. So that curve helps. Uh, and the curve is the, the wasp in particular will pound that mud partition with their head. So on the inside of the curve, it'll be quite smooth and on the outside of the curve quite rough. So it's also the, the feeling or the texture of the partition that helps get the adult wasp or bee uh, headed in the right direction to, the exit, ex to exit the cavity. Now, if we look at the, some of the similarities of ground nesting uh, solitary wasps and ground nesting bees, this is a, the top image is a picture of one of the pollen specialists of willow, the, and this is the colorful willow mining bee. And you can see her scopa or pollen collecting structures are loaded up with pollen and she preferentially nests in sand. So her nest burrow has sort of collapsed because, because of the friability of the sand and she's re-excavating and drilling down into that sand into her burrow loaded with her, her pollen. The bottom image shows an American sand wasp and this wasp also likes to nest in loose sand. The females excavate um, very shallow burrows and exclusively hunt different kinds of flies. So the bottom middle and right images of the female uh, who, that has captured a surfed fly or flower fly. She's got it clutched underneath her and she's quickly reopening the nest burrow in order to take it inside the fly inside of her nest to lay her egg on. So lots of fun similarities. So if for those of you who are wondering, well, how many wasp species do we have in North America, North of Mexico? Uh, the answer is approximately 13,000 species when we group the parasitic wasps and the stinging wasps together. But for the, the rest of the presentation, I'm going to be talking about the stinging wasps, the predatory wasps. And so that includes approximately 2,900 species. And as I mentioned earlier, the, the females are the ones that are looking for the food sources and putting the food source inside of the nest. They're hunting either insects or spiders. And the reason that the ovipositor has become modified, the females use the, the modified ovipositor, which is now their sting, to sting their prey. And that's the case for solitary wasps. Uh, but in fact, social wasps don't typically sting their prey. 
they, uh, as you probably are well aware, <laughs> they use their prey to defend their nest. So that also includes humans getting stung if we accidentally disturb the nest of a social wasp. But that's, there's a, that's a really important um, distinction so that you understand uh, all of these solitary wasps, similar to solitary bees, really uh, have no interest in stinging humans. And <clears throat> they're likely present in the gardens and landscapes that you work in and they just really go largely unnoticed because there is never a negative interaction with so many of these solitary wasps. Uh, so I'm going to start off by uh, featuring the social wasp, the wasp that probably most people don't like so much. And um, but it's important to know that in North America, only the social wasps only make up one and a half percent of the total number of wasp species. So that's a good thing if you're really not fond of social wasps because of the fear of getting stung. They really don't make up a huge proportion of the total number of wasps. All of our social wasps in Eastern North America are constructing nests of, with paper. And I'll talk a little bit about that fiber collection in the following slides. They do have the same modified ovipositor as, as the solitary stinging wasp. But as I mentioned earlier, they're generally not stinging their prey like a solitary wasp. So when they capture a prey, they just quickly uh, chew it up and that obviously kills it <laughs> and, and subdues it. And you can see the picture of this pa female paper wasp. She's got a chewed up caterpillar clutched in her mandibles and she's ready to fly back to the nest to, to and then once she gets there, that, that clump of former caterpillar will get broken up and then fed to the larva. So while she's chewing up that her prey, it could be caterpillar, it could be beetle larva. Many of our social wasps don't are prey specialists. Um, she's also sort of ingesting some of the fluids of the prey. So that's kind of a secondary food source for some of our social wasps. And in Eastern North America, social wasps really are broken up into two groups. The, the paper wasps, which includes wasps in the genus Polistes, and then the yellow jackets, and that includes two genera, Vespula and Delico Vespula. We also have, uh, and uh, you're probably aware of the murder hornets and the European hornets. Those are introduced species and they belong to the genus Vespa. Uh, so paper wasps are the wasps that uh, nest above ground. They build very simple nests that don't include a paper envelope. So it's just typically one nest comb that is attached to a horizontal surface. In urban environments that can include uh, places like our house soffits. And, um, and I'll talk a little bit about uh, how those nests are initiated in the following slide. Um, the Vespula for the most part are constructing uh, the social nest below ground. So they um, are the ones that we humans generally have negative interactions with because uh, maybe the nest, we're not aware that the nest is there and we mow, our, mow over them and their nest defense goes, goes into high gear and we end up getting stung by some of the Vespula that nest below ground. Uh, for the most part, other than the really northern species that, that occur in northern cold boreal areas, many of the Delico Vespula nest above ground. And you can see the differences in the paper wasp and that beautiful conical uh, above ground aerial nest that the, the Delico Vespula build. It it's, has many layers of uh, outer nest paper or an envelope, and that helps buffer it from high winds and cold temperatures. Many of the Vespula that nest below ground source uh, rotting wood, so their nest is not uh, that beautiful combination of different grays. It can have a, a yellow or an orange tone to the paper. So paper wasps, as, as well as the other uh, social wasps, have to find a source for fiber to make their nest paper. So the nest, even the individual combs or cells with, that make up the comb are made of paper and that, re that requires layer upon layer of the females adding um, paper fiber in order to make this long linear cell. The cells are actually round when they first construct them, much like uh, a honeybee comb. 
And then when additional cells are added around the original cell, uh, they, they, they turn into that hexagonal form. So you may find paper wasps um, going to dry grass stalks or old plant stalks. Uh, many of the Vespula and Dolico Vespula seem to prefer dry wood. And as I mentioned, some source rotting wood, particularly the ones that nest below ground. If you have, I have a cedar picket fence, so I often find the females, the workers, um, chewing the wood fiber from the cedar picket fence in order to collect that. And so a lot of chewing goes on. There are uh, saliva as well as some man mandibular gland secretions get combined with the paper as they chew it up and they take the lumps back to the nest. They do more chewing of it and they finally uh, get it to the right consistency in order to make that beautiful paper for their nest. Now the paper wasps are, I'll just talk a little bit about their life cycle. Uh, what's different about paper wasps if you compare them to the yellow jackets is the uh, many females typically uh, hibernate together in little groups. And so they are the future nest foundresses, or if you're familiar with a bumblebee life cycle, the, the females that have mated with males in typically in late summer or autumn, and then they overwinter as adults. And you may find, typically you'll find those new nest foundresses coming out on warm days, even when there aren't, there aren't any plants blooming. Um, they'll come out, they'll maybe stretch their legs. They may even go back to their natal nest to find some food, a little droplets of uh, nectar droplets inside of the nest to feed on, but then they go back to their um, hibernation place until it truly warms up. So much like a bumblebee nest, the females uh, produce or the nest foundresses produce females in their first and often second brood. And those become workers that help enlarge the nest uh, and look for prey to feed the larva. And then in the summer, uh, males are produced followed by the future nest foundresses. So other than living in the uh, far south, southeast or maybe Gulf Coast, most of our social wasps have an annual uh, colony or high or uh, nest rather. And so the, at the end of the year, all of the occupants die except for those newly mated females. Why are paper wasps important? Well, they actually, of all the social wasps, they have a little bit more prey specificity. They primarily hunt caterpillars. They may also hunt sawfly larvae. But uh, many of the caterpillars that they hunt are, they're considered beneficial because they're hunting things like fall army webworm, uh, the tobacco hornworm, which is uh, a caterpillar that consumes plants in the nightshade family, including tobacco and tomatoes. And they'll hunt things like cabbage looper larvae. So it's actually quite beneficial to have a paper wasp nest near your vegetable garden because they're doing a lot of pest population control of some of those foliage consuming uh, caterpillars. Uh, I'll talk about uh, specific plants at the end of the presentation. So I'm just gonna continue on with the, 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 this part of the talking about social wasps. So the other social wasps are the yellow jackets, which include the genera Vespula and Delico Vespula. Their life cycle, if you're familiar with bumblebees, is pretty much exactly the same. So just a single new reproductive female is overwintering as an adult by herself. And you'll often, if you turn, flip over logs lying on the ground, for example, um, that you may find a, a, a new queen or future queen that's um, tucked herself under the log to hibernate there for the winter. Um, their nest is, uh, of course, then established by one female and similar to paper wasp, they start by producing female offspring first to help with uh, the prey collection and uh, rearing more larvae. And then in the summer, the nests start to produce males followed by reproductive females. For, so from a gardening standpoint, you don't see many, um, similar to bumblebees, you don't see many bumblebees in early spring other than a few queens. And then once those colonies start to produce workers and then followed by males, by the end of the growing season, you'll see a lot of males in particular foraging for nectar on some of our fall blooming plants such as goldenrods and asters. The, uh, these two groups of social insects are not 
um, prey specialist. So they really just hunt a, a fairly wide variety of live insects, but um, the, the ones in the Vespula genus will also eat scavenged prey. So sometimes uh, one year I was pulling Japanese beetles off a plant and just stepping on them on my walkway. We probably don't, I'm not recommending you do that, <laughs> but it attracted a number of the wasps in the uh, Vespula genus and they would come and actually feed on the squished Japanese beetles that I left on my walkway. All right, so the rest of the presentation, I really wanna tell you about the solitary wasps because to me, they're the most fascinating and interesting and the ones that are very closely related to bees. And just like bees, they either nest below ground or above ground. Um, they, the, diff the big difference between them and social wasps is their sting is very important because they are utilizing their sting to sting the prey. And often the prey, this is a, a sand wasp that I have pictured in the bottom image and she's clutching a, a plant bug underneath her. But in some cases, these solitary wasps will hunt prey that is much larger than, than themselves. So they need to quickly subdue the prey so that it doesn't uh, scurry away or fly off. And so that initial sting of the prey really starts to cause partial and then results in full paralysis. And many of these solitary wasps will sting their prey more than once. And once that paralysis uh, starts to happen, then they have this uh, prey that's immobile, easy to handle, and they're able to easily transport it back to their nest to stalk inside of their nest. And the really depends on the wasp. So typically if a wasp is hunting prey that's much smaller than the female, she may be hunting multiple prey and caching multiple prey inside an individual brood cell. Um, the flip side of that, you, uh, for example, the Eastern cicada killer hunts just one big cicada and that's enough food for an individual larva to consume while it develops. So the number of prey is really seasonally dependent. If you think of caterpillars being smaller or in, or in an earlier instar stage earlier in the spring versus a wasp hunting caterpillars in the middle of summer, she may find much larger later instar caterpillars. So the prey numbers of prey inside of the nest can change even as the season progresses. So the benefit, the other benefit of that paralysis uh, that results from the female stinging the prey is that the prey is still alive. So that bottom image of the caterpillars and you can see the little wasp larva uh, attached to one of the caterpillars to start feeding on it. Um, there's, there would be a risk of the larva or the egg laid on the prey getting damaged if the prey was still able to move around. So the prey is paralyzed, but it also is alive. So it remains fresh. So it's sort of like a wasp refrigerator type um, plan. And then the larva has this fresh food source to consume as it develops. So solitary wasps need similar habitat to bees, but the really critical third component besides an abundance of flowering plants that will be providing their main food source, flower nectar and less often pollen. Um, they also need specific plants that are hosting their prey. Um, and many of the solitary wasps are prey specialists and I'll show you some examples. And much like bees, um, some are very, have very specific nesting preferences. Some will only nest in sand. Others uh, are nesting above ground, perhaps in cavities in wood. So their nesting or habitat would be tied to the edge habitat that's near woodlands to provide those opportunities. And so there's a, a couple of extra layers that, uh, of habitat needs that a wasp needs compared to bees. So here's an example. This is a type of mason wasp, uh, Leptochylus. And the females nest in pithy uh, stems. And I'm showing a picture here of smooth sumac. So that would be an example where a branch is broken off and uh, then the female would chew out the pith filled center into that stem to make her nesting cavity, very similar to bees. Um, this particular mason wasp hunts uh, beetle larva as well as weevils. So her nesting site needs to be in close proximity to where those 
uh, particular weevils or beetle larvae occur or are feeding. And then she also needs the uh, nearby abundance of flowering plants to help fuel the, the, the nest, nest provisioning and nest building activities. And so this, this scenario will play out differently for every single uh, solitary wasp, depending on their prey needs and their flowering plant preferences. So what's really interesting and not surprising and um, really what I uh, found out a lot more while researching the book is that most of the solitary wasps have very specific prey and the prey specificity can be quite broad. Maybe a wasp is hunting insects from multiple families, but one order, but it can get quite narrow. They may only hunt insects from one genus. So the acorn weevil wasp on the bottom left uh, is an example of just one genus and they're hunting uh, acorn weevils that uh, bore into acorns. So that she's got to set up her uh, below ground nest near oak trees in order to find her food source. Uh, similarly, the five spotted spider wasp is hunting spiders that belong to a single family. And so these spiders and these acorn weevils uh, all have different habitats themselves. So you can see how it gets quite complex about um, these wasps having all of the habitat needs that they need. And we also have bees uh, in the Philanthus genus that hunt, or wasps rather, that hunt bees. And the example here is a fall occurring uh, pleasant bee wolf and she hunts bees in the sweat bee family, Halictidae. So this prey specificity uh, in a landscape context is really interesting because wasps, uh, those individual solitary wasps are hunting all different kinds of insects and as well as spiders. So you can see how if we took wasps out of the equation that many of the leaf and seed eating insects populations would just really go um, unchecked. And so wasps really have two very important ecosystem services that they provide, the, the pest population control, and then the incidental or secondary pollination of flowering plants. And prey specificity is really interesting because it can result in a scenario like this. And I have this image in the book, and this is no exaggeration. This is a dry, uh, sandy gravel path through a park in my neighborhood. And in addition to finding about 12 different bee species nesting in this footpath, um, the, and all of these different solitary wasps also preferentially like to nest in either loose sand in the middle of the path or compacted sand along the edge of the path. And why can they share this nesting habitat? It's because of prey specificity. Each one is hunting um, flies, one is hunting ants, the other is hunting bees. So they all have their own prey. So they're not competing for their, essentially their food sources that they want to feed their larva. So if you know of some really good sandy habitats, and if you're already sort of a bee watcher, uh, you know that sandy habitats can be a bonanza for different uh, species of ground nesting bees, but uh, you can also start to look for some of these solitary wasps. And it's about 80% of the solitary wasps that do nest below ground, so a little bit higher number than our uh, native bees in Eastern North America. And just like uh, a bee, the female does all of the excavation of the nest, the nest architecture can be very, really variable. So one, one type of wasp may only build or excavate a single cell. Um, a, another kind of wasp may have a really complex nest architecture with multiple cells. So it really is uh, species dependent. And, and as I mentioned earlier, the, the number of prey that an individual wasp puts in the cell is dependent on the prey size, the ability of the female to manage and handle and transport the prey back to the nest. So if you're looking for wasp nests, um, they can somewhat resemble uh, some bee nests. Sometimes the, like the beetle wasp nest I have in the upper right will have the soil mounded around the burrow opening. Uh, in, some case, in many cases, the, because of the excavation technique, the, the, the tumulus or the soil mound will be lopsided in the bottom right image because the female's pushing all of that uh, excavated material to one side. 
And here's an example of a ground nesting solitary wasp, a very common and uh, one that often catch, captures people's attention because it's an absolutely um, beautiful wasp, the great golden digger wasp. And this is an example of a solitary wasp that uh, has a very similar nest structure to some of our solitary bees. So the female excavates a main burrow and then has lateral offshoots and individual brood cells that she excavates. And in her brood cells, she puts uh, somewhere between two and six uh, true katydids or, cat, or true crickets rather, or katydids. So you can see that female in the bottom right image and how much larger the prey is. In some cases, they, the females are able to fly with their prey clutch beneath them, but in other cases, they may have to drag it across the ground because it's simply too heavy. Uh, and I'm gonna play a video, so hopefully this works for you guys, but. So hopefully you could hear that. I turned up the volume, but that a, was a great golden digger wasp. And um, that buzzing mechanism or that sonication is very similar to the buzz pollination mechanism used by bees. So many, uh, many of the wasps in the family Sphecidae and some of the carbonid wasps use this mechanism and it's uh, the vibration of their thoracic muscles and they use that for nest excavation. So the female would be grasping hold of the soil uh, clumps and then vibrating her thoracic muscles in order to almost jackhammer or loosen the burrow. Why she's trying to, here she's trying to nest in a gravel driveway, <laughs> which I wouldn't recommend, but uh, because she was having so much difficulty uh, excavating her burrow. But that was one of the really uh, fascinating things that I explored more in the book because of the similarities of buzz pollination and this sonication mechanism to dig up, dig their nests. So here's an example of a solitary ground nesting wasp, the American sand wasp, that only excavates one cell. But in a female's short lifetime, uh, she will be excavating multiple cells, multiple nests rather, um, in close proximity. And she loves loose sand, which is kind of a really difficult uh, nesting soil type to nest in because the sand's constantly collapsing. Um, but what's unusual about this particular solitary wasp is she progressively provisions the nest. So she, rather than uh, preparing the nest cell, putting a whole bunch of prey in there, laying an egg and closing it up so the larva has the food source to consume while it develops, uh, this wasp will um, prepare a nest brood cell, capture one fly, stuff it in the nest, lay an egg on it, leave the nest open, and then over the following uh, days to weeks, she'll go back into the nest burrow, check on the food supply of the larva, and then continue to bring it more flies as needed. So that's a quite, quite unusual behavior um, that this particular sand wasp has. Uh, and because just like bees, uh, bees have a strong sense of parental care. They provide all of that wonderful food source for their offspring. But generally, uh, solitary adult bees never see their offspring develop into adults because they've long since perished. And that's usually the case with solitary wasps. But this is an unusual uh, uh, example of not following that, that uh, schedule. And here's an, another example of a ground nesting solitary wasp, the Eastern Cicada Killer, one of our largest uh, predatory wasps in Eastern North America. Um, quite a beautiful wasp. You'll find more so the, the males visiting flowering plants. The males also can set up territories and can be quite gregarious and fly around. Um, making sort of threatening flights even around people's heads. And so unfortunately, many nesting aggregations of this wasp can get destroyed by folks not understanding um, the wasp lifestyle and behaviors. But the females uh, really have an amazing feat of strength because they fly up into the trees, they have to capture this huge cicada and manage to hold on to it and sting it before it tries to get away. 
And then once that paralysis sets in, that cicada can sometimes weigh two to three times the, the weight of the female wasp. So she's got to sort of launch from the tree and, and in the right direction back to her nest. And in some cases, that's why many people photograph the females on the ground. They're either resting while they're transporting prey or they simply just can't um, fly with the prey because it's too heavy. So the 20% of the solitary wasps are nesting above ground. And this example of a mason wasp nest of a wasp that hunts caterpillars in the image, the, just like the below ground nest, the female is preparing a nest cell before she goes out and hunts for prey. And then the nest cell is gonna have anywhere from one to many uh, prey within it to feed the offspring. And um, cavities, uh, just like bees, wa solitary wasps are nesting in similar situations. So hollow plant stems, that graphic that Denise showed, um, we do have wasps that will also nest in those stems. Um, they are looking also for cavities in wood, so in standing dead trees. And then as I mentioned earlier, some of our pith pithy woody plants such as sumac and elderberry would be good nesting sites for some of these above ground nesting wasps. These are some examples of solitary predatory wasps that nest in logs lying on the ground. And um, there's a, a number of other ones that I don't have pictured here, but um, so they would be, obviously their habitat would be tied to the edge of woodlands, in woodlands. In the case of the Lestica, that image in the bottom right, the adults hunt, uh, the wasps hunt adult moss. So they may primarily just spend most of their time in woodlands where their prey occurs. That's not the case with some of these other wood nesting wasps. So their habitat really um, comes down to being on the edge of two different plant communities. Similar with cavities in wood, uh, standing dead trees, those holes were likely created by beetle larva and then uh, some of our solitary native bees as well as solitary wasps will utilize those as nesting sites. And then the ones that don't look, seek out pre-existing cavities, we have a number of solitary wasps that build freeform mud nests. And these are some examples. The Walden's mason wasp makes uh, mud uh, cylinders often attached to a hard surface. In this case, this female was building uh, her nest on the back uh, riser of a concrete step in my yard. And then we have uh, potter wasps that make, make these beautiful jug shaped uh, mud nests and they, they can occur singly. You may find one attached to a plant leaf or you may find a grouping of them on plants or even on the side of a building. And they, both of these wasps are hunting caterpillars. So the, the potter wasp will lay her egg, um, she'll stick her abdomen inside of the opening when she's finished creating that jug shaped nest, lay her egg suspended from a piece of silk from the top or roof of the jug. And then she goes and hunts caterpillars and stuff the, stuffs the caterpillars inside of the opening. And then when she feels there's enough uh, caterpillars for her offspring to eat, she closes up that mud opening and uh, repeats the process. So these uh, wasps, the mud building wasps need an available source of soil. Some of them are specifically looking for sand and they'll be combining their saliva as well as water with the sand. The saliva helps um, the sand hold structure, but many are looking for soil. And they're typically collecting water first. And just like bees, solitary wasps have a crop where they store water. And when they return to the nest, or sorry, when they find their soil source, they gather it with their mandibles, regurgitate water to moisten it. So you may find a wasp with this moist clump of soil in her mandibles and she's collecting to take back to her nest. It's, the mud is used as nest uh, closures in the cavity as well as the partitions. Um, and, but there's this uh, wonderful black and yellow mud dauber wasp and a few other species that forego that two-step process. They, they instead, the females look for uh, moist mud, typically along creeks or other uh, wetlands and uh, collect the moist mud in a big clump and then carry that back. And they make free form mud nests and stuff them with uh, spiders. And if you've seen uh, where there's an ideal sort of moist mud source for these wasps, many of the females 
will gather together. And they also use that same vibratory mechanism. So they'll clasp hold of the moist mud, vibrate their thoracic muscles in order to loosen it and get this nice clump. And then they actually use the same vibratory mechanism um, as, and they shake the mud as they build their mud cylinders, um, on, usually sometimes attached to buildings. And uh, we have wasps that um, build freeform mud nests in uh, on hard surfaces. So I mentioned the concrete, but even like a shallow cavity in a rock, you may find some mud nests that have been attached to that. The crevice mason wasp is common in disturbed habitats. So even like industrial areas with concrete In this picture of the female on the right, she's actually building her nest in a hole in my uh, neighbor's sidewalk. So I'm gonna finish off talking about flower preferences because I know many of you tuning in are gardeners and interested in planting for pollinating insects. Uh, many of our wasp species have very short tongues as in compared to their, their bee cousins. Uh, many of our bees have very long tongues which enables them to access nectar from complex flowers. Um, but our wasps generally have fairly short tongues. So that really, uh, determines the types of flowering plants that they can visit. So the ones that are seeking out flower nectar will be visiting shower, shallow flowering plants, but you may also find a wasp perched on a leaf below an aphid population. And that wasp would be consuming the honeydew that has collected on the leaf below the, the aphids. Um, early spring is a good place to look for wasps uh, consuming sap from trees. They will also consume the um, sap in midsummer that can often get fermented and um, with from naturally occurring yeast. So if you have a sap flow on a diseased tree, you also may find wasp consuming that. And as I mentioned earlier, they the social wasp uh, consume some of the hemolymph, hemolymph, which is the insect blood type um, fluid, as well as when they chew it up, they consume some of the fluids. So the flower visitation, of course, just like our solitary bees, all of these solitary wasps have their own se seasonal phenology. So it's really dependent on what plants bloom while the adults are active, uh, which would determine their flower preferences. But the big one, of course, is just their ability to access the nectar. So they're going to typically totally avoid complex flowers. Uh, but of course, like maybe large carbon debris, um, they will chew a, a hole at the bottom of a complex flower corolla to steal the nectar by inserting their tongue into that. But the flower nectar is providing them with carbohydrates and amino acids, similar uh, nutrient type calories that the bees are seeking out. Uh, many of our solitary predatory wasps really like white flowering plants. So this is a picture of a a, a tachytes sand wasp uh, visiting white prairie clover. And I, if you have white and purple prairie clover growing side by side, you're generally gonna see a lot more visitation to the white prairie clover than the purple by wasps. So um, distilling down all of the different plant wasp interactions for my book, um, it really came down to these four dominant plant families. The, the carrot, the aster, the mint, and the dogbane and milkweed families that are the primary um, plant families that wasps like to visit. And you can see that those plants primarily have the shallow flower forms and easy to access nectar. So I thought I would highlight some of the plants or the genera in these different plant families. The carrot family typically has the real flat topped umbels with very shallow flowers. Uh, rattlesnake master, if you're familiar with that plant, you, you wouldn't think at first glance that that plant would belong to the carrot family, but it has white uh, spherical or globe shaped flower heads, but it's also a very good uh, wasp plant. Um, the Asteraceae family, of course, the composites very diverse and we, it's very easy to garden and have a plant in that family blooming at any time throughout the growing season. The big players for wasps are fleabane um, in the fall goldenrod and aster, and then the Eupatorium genus in particular. So depending on where you live, that could include uh, bone sets or, or thoroughworts. Those are excellent wasp plants.
And finally, uh, the mint family, um, hands down and any, any species in the Pycnanthemum or mountain mint genus is an excellent wasp plant. So you just have to find out what plants are native to your area in that genus. Um, and then the Monarda genus, generally the wasps really like the horse mint, which is the Monarda punctata. Um, the wild bergamot or bee balm, you'll find that uh, wasp uh, nectary thievery going on where they'll chew a hole at the base of the flower corolla. So, and finally milkweeds. So milkweeds are offering nectar. They don't offer pollen to flower visiting insects, but wasps, some of the larger wasps like that um, thinned wasps that I have pictured, um, because of their size, they've been shown to be very good um, transfers of or vectors of that sticky uh, po packaged pollen on milkweed flowers. And dog bane in Indian, Indian hemp, not exactly uh, plants that we want to grow in our gardens, but if you're managing larger landscapes, those are excellent wasp plants. And I threw in uh, euphorbia as well. Our native euphorbias are really attract a large diversity of different wasps. So I apologize for the hard stop, but I didn't want to go over time today. And uh, this is only the second time I've presented on, on this topic. So I would appreciate any feedback uh, you have, and I hope you um, have a new appreciation for some of these beautiful wasps that you may see in your garden. Great, thanks so much, Heather. What a great talk. Can you tell us when the book, is it, um, is it out yet or is it about to be out? The, yeah, the book is out. It came out mid-February and um, it's available through the publisher. You'll find it on Amazon um, and hopefully in other brick and mortar stores once we get past COVID. <laughs> yeah. Great. So here in Ohio, when we um, came up with some educational elements, some um, little bee cards and bee posters to help people learn about bees, um, it was a real awakening for me when I had to actually back up and start with wasps. So, um, so what perspective do you find with, with uh, you know, the public that you interact with? Is there a lot of knowledge about wasps? Not much about wasps? I would say not much at all. And, you know, other than the people that are really starting to get into the pollinator observation and maybe pollinator photography are noticing wasps. Um, I started writing the book almost four years ago and I thought I have no idea if we're, the world is ready <laughs> for a book about wasps, but I think um, the folks that are really into bees hopefully understand now that they, there's so many similarities in the lifestyles and the things that we're already doing for bees in our gardens, even the stem nesting stubble will help uh, some of the, our wasp species. Right, that's really good, good to know. Um, so uh, we'll, we'll go through a few of the top questions that came in. Folks, we'll, uh, we're coming up on the hour now. So if you need to hop out, I understand you might have other things to do, but um, Heather's agreed to stick around and answer a few questions. And um, we'll post this recording so you can check back in later to see the, the Q&A portion. So Cindy asks, how beneficial are the Mason Bee boxes I see sold at Costco and other stores? Is it a phony decoration or truly helpful? Well, it really is dependent on the design and Denise, you'll probably agree that they're now sort of mass produced and um, some of them have very poor designs. They could, they could be too shallow. So that, that, that length of the cavity is what's really critical. Remember the image of the individual brood cells lined up in the cavity, the more the better, right? Because then at least the, the bees or wasps developing at the back of the cavity can ensure that they make it to adulthood. And so the many of the ones that are designed and maybe manufactured in China and then sold at your Home Depot or Costco may not be the best construction or architecture. I just generally like to stick with um, recommendations of providing those mimicking the natural habitat situations, the, the stem stubble, the logs on the ground. And if you have a larger property leaving some standing dead trees. It just prevents uh, disease transmission. Um, folks have great intentions, but they don't necessarily keep those uh, supplemental nests cleaned and replace the stems. So I would try and avoid them uh, unless you're gonna be very vigilant about, or vigilant about um, 
you know, doing that stem replacement and cleaning. Okay, great. So Elizabeth has kind of a related question and she said that the snow plow through snow uh, smashing all of her standing stems and she wants to know what to do with those. Does she gather them up? Uh, will they still emerge? Um, so the, the snow plow kind of just sounds like knock them over. Sounds like, right. Yeah, you could probably, um, you can stick them back in the ground. And that's something I've shown messy, my messy hillside of my stem stubble and what it looks like in the spring. You don't have to keep those stems in place where the plant grew. So as long as you're cutting ones that are maybe 20 or 22 inches, you can stick them in the ground near vertical or similar orientation to the flowering plant stalk anywhere in your garden. So those ones the plow pushed over, I would just trim them and then stick them back in the ground and they, they should be utilized by bees or, or wasps. <laughs> yeah. Okay, great. Um, so uh, several people ask questions about European paper wasps and them possibly being a, an issue with monarchs um, and other native caterpillars. So maybe you could address uh, that specifically. Yeah, the, so the European paper wasp has a number of competitive advantages. Um, I was at a conference a couple of years ago and I apologize, I can't remember the researcher, but he did demonstrate that many, a, a lot of the predation on monarch caterpillars by paper wasp was the European paper wasp. Um, and the European paper wasp tends to nest in more disturbed habitats. So in urban situations, it's very adaptable. The other thing, it doesn't have natural enemies because it's not from North America. And the females uh, tend to come out earlier than our native paper wasps from their hibernation. So they're, they're establishing nests earlier. They may be taking um, some of those ideal nesting opportunities away from the native paper wasps. And they also, I photographed the European paper wasp actually stealing prey from the native paper wasp. So uh, native paper wasp has captured a caterpillar and is chewing it up to transport back to the nest. And the European paper wasp comes in and actually just steals it from them. So there's a, I've got some information on some additional um, concerns about the competitiveness and in, as far as nests and prey for the European paper wasp, so. Okay, great. Uh, Jean asks, can you distinguish between wasp and hornet? Um, and when should one be used versus the other? Well, that's a great question. So, you know, we always get into trouble with common names, but hornet is, you can think of as the a European social wasp. So hornet is um, generally any introduced wasp such as the murder hornet or the European hornet. We do have um, the one native species, the bald-faced hornet that has the common name hornet, but it's in fact a yellow jacket and not a hornet. So that's kind of the, to me, the nomenclature or the differentiation between what is a hornet and what is a, a wasp. Uh, so in North America, generally we, we call them wasps, not hornets. Okay, great. Uh, Timberly is a beekeeper and has noticed many yellow jackets feeding on the dead bees outside of the hives. Are uh, my hives at risk in any way or will the yellow jackets simply feed on the dead bees and stay out of the hives? Yeah, they probably are the yellow jackets in the genus Vespula. And as I mentioned, though, many of those species are scavengers of dead insects. So, um, in that scenario, they're likely just collecting or feeding on, it's a food source for them to feed on the, the dead honeybees outside of the hive. And the, in some of those introduced hornets, of course, and you probably are aware of this, are of concern because they will actually invade hives um, to, to capture the bee, the bee larva to consume. So they are more problematic than um, I would say our, our native social wasps that may be attracted to the the dead bees outside of the hive. Okay, um, let's spend a few minutes on those stems that are still, I didn't do my fall cleanup yet, but it's not too late. <laughs> not new growth hasn't emerged yet. I've been hearing some people talk lately about like a temperature target to take those stems down. Do you have any opinion on that? Or how can we time um, if we're gonna, if we wanna clean up that stubble, what's the best way to do that? Yeah, I've been, 
I've been measuring soil temperatures for the last seven or eight years to see how that coincides with um, some of the, for example, the small carpenter bees, which seem to come out pretty early or, or early for stem nesters in the spring. And what I have found is, um, and I use this purchased a digital kitchen thermometer and then, you know, stick it in the ground and until it bottoms out. And I generally find around when the soil reaches 45 to 50 degrees is when I start to see the uh, cavity nesters coming out. So that I use that as a general rule of thumb of where and when to start cutting and doing garden work. The, the other way you can work ahead of that schedule is if you have somewhere to stand, such as on a lawn or a sidewalk or where you're not tromping through a garden, you can do a lot of work that way by cutting stuff down, but wait to go actually go in your garden and tromp around until those soil temperatures come up a little bit. Okay, great. That's, that's really helpful because I was hearing that 50 degree measure, but 50 degree air temperature, you know, doesn't make sense, but the yeah. soil temperature yeah. is really helpful. Yeah, it's more, you know, centered around heating degree days. And um, then for those, those uh, particularly the below, below ground nesters or other beneficial insects that are spending the winter under leaf litter or just in the top layer of the soil, that's the risk of, you know, tramping on those. So 50 degrees tends to be a good turning point for emergence of some of those species. Great. So um, Daniel wonders, are there techniques to discourage stinging wasps from nesting near decks, soffits, um, patio umbrellas, et cetera? Yeah, it's tough. Uh, so if you had a nest in, the, in that situation near your home the previous year, because those social wasps, uh, the females grew up in the nest and then they overwinter and then they generally may look for in the same area as the, uh, their natal nest occurred. Um, there are, so if you wanna just keep a watch in early spring to discourage nest establishment in a similar place, um, generally the, the ones that nest above ground Paper wasps, if they're nesting on your soffit and it's not near a door or human activity, they tend to be pretty docile unless you really disturb their nest. And same with the aerial yellow jacket wasps, uh, they're nesting often 10, 20 feet up in trees. So there's less sort of negative interactions. So I would um, try and discourage ones where, you know, eight to 10 feet where there's going to be a high traffic of people and walking and so on but you just really have to stay on watch early in the spring before that nest starts to get occupied by many wasps and then you don't, you don't want to disturb it. Okay, and kind of along those lines, Erica asks if you have other advice for living in harmony with wasps, which I think is an awesome perspective. <laughs> well, yeah, I, the, other than the social wasps that nest in the ground, um, we can live in harmony with them and they can be in our gardens and landscapes. So it's really just being a good observer. Um, I, you know, I have ground nesting wasps in my garden every year. Um, it's just, and particularly when that activity gets really high and it's, you know, what we'd call a hive of activity of social wasps coming in and out of a hole in the ground. Um, well, you know, a nest is there, it's annual. If you're able just to keep 10 feet away from it, they will do their thing. And generally you won't have a negative interaction. It's just when we don't know a nest is there when people get stung. So take some time to really walk around and observe and, um, and enjoy. And hopefully you don't have any <laughs> bad interactions this growing season. You know, you can decide whether you want to go with this um, topic or not, but, you know, carpenter bees always come up and I know we're focused on wasps, um, but kind of managing all of those critters that we're not so crazy about around the home. Do you, do you want to talk a little bit about carpenter bees and how we can uh, avoid problems? Well, I'd be interested to know if you have found anything that works to discourage them, Denise, because everybody I speak with, you know, I hear anecdotal things such as keep the wood painted. Um, I've heard that hanging a, a paper, an aerial yellow jacket paper like nest, you know, near where they may want to nest will discourage them, but. Or, or a paper bag, I've heard. A paper bag. Uh, I don't have any evidence of 
whether those things work. Um, unfortunately, large carpenter bees are one of our few truly damaging wood boring bees. That, but uh, where I live, we don't have very many. So I'm always <laughs> putting it, I'll put it back on you, Denise, if you have any <laughs> tips. Well, it's interesting because these little um, traps are available. You can either purchase them or, you know, there are little YouTube videos on how to make them with a mason jar and a little roof and the hole in the right size diameter to trap the bees. And they do collect a lot of bees, but I really haven't seen any research. Um, haven't looked in the last few months, but haven't seen any research that shows um do they kill, do they trap more females than males? Do they attract more? Um, does it really control the population? Or are you just having that sense of fulfillment because there are dead carpenter bees um, in that mason jar in the end, but there are also a lot of, not so many, but there can be some other beneficial, some other wasps, un unintended victims in that, um, that collection. Right, uh, I did hear the other sort of anecdotal thing is to drill, um, sort of small uh, holes into wood, um, you know, buying a piece of lumber and putting it near where there's carpent bees are nesting to help influence them to nest in this piece of wood you've purchased versus your deck or siding. <laughs> but I don't know if that works either, so. Yeah, I think Heather, if we did a little video of that carpenter bee um, with that decoy hole, you could hear the little laughter there. <laughs> yeah. You thought this was gonna work. <laughs> Yeah. So it is a it is a difficult question, and I'll um, refer folks to your county extension office, whatever state you're in. There's probably an excellent fact sheet that has local recommendations, whether those are pesticide repellents or other uh, recommendations that are specific to your part of the country that can help manage it. It is, uh, as Heather said, a difficult wood pest, and they can do significant damage. So ignoring them is not an option, especially if you have a wood sided house, because then the woodpeckers come and um, you have a whole diverse ecosystem there. <laughs> um, Heather, let's end up by um, talking about mud daubers. Um, are, they, are they social or solitary? Um, what do they do with the mud? Who do they put inside? So yeah, I featured the, the black and yellow mud daubers and they're, they're solitary. And they, so they build sort of that similar mud cylinder like or mud cylinders often attached to a, your shed or maybe a structure. And they're stuffing those full with uh, spiders. There's also a wasp that I didn't talk about the, um, boy, I'm not gonna remember the common name. It, the wasps in the genus Tripoxylin and they are the organ, oh yeah, organ pipe mud daubers. So they have the really unique um, linear, long linear cells that they build side by side. And many of those also hunt spiders. So, and then we have wasps that uh, reuse those mud cylinders. So they'll sort of gather some water, soften it and reshape it. And then that becomes their nesting site the following year. So you could have a whole ecosystem <laughs> of different wasps if you do have some of those mud cylinders in, in your garden or landscape. Great, fascinating. Thanks so much, Heather. So uh, folks, I'm sure Heather would appreciate a thank you in the chat box. Heather, a really wonderful program. I always learn so much and uh, can't wait to keep uh, looking at your iNaturalist observations, see what you're seeing and um, take a really good good look at the book. I, um, I keep these two handy all the time. I was just looking at um, queen bumblebees feeding on Dutchman's breeches. Oh, yeah. uh, which, there's some just some great images. She's an amazing photographer. So.